end up recording. Welcome back to the Money Advantage podcast. This is your host, Rachel Marshall, Bruce Weiner, and the admirable Rabbi Daniel Lapin back for another conversation on our show. Rabbi, welcome to the show today. Hi, Rachel. Good to be back, as always. Really, I'm delighted you had me back. Means that last time wasn't a total calamity. <laughs> <laughs> I love the word calamity, and I'm glad that it wasn't. No, in fact, we had a, ro- a really, really wonderful reception to the conversation last time where we were discussing Thou Shall Prosper, one of your best known books. And this was biblical foundations for really success in every area of life, but specifically in the area of money. And that's not the title of your book, but that's kind of what it all encompassed, these biblical rules for living. And so today we really wanted to deep dive more on some of your wonderful wisdom for living and specifically this book, The Holistic You, Uh, that you have really talked about how to have this integrated way of looking at life and finance and relationships and family and really doing all of this well, because I think there can be this challenge in thinking that I can have one or the other. I can do something and not both. And so we are really here to have a wonderful conversation with you today. So thank you for being willing to join us. Oh, it's a, p- a pleasure. Like I told you last time, last time uh, there are two kinds of interviews that, that I do. One of them is is grueling and painful and rough, and and the other one is a pleasure. And when time is up, I look at my watch. I can't believe the time gone by so quickly. And, <laughs> and uh, yours is in the latter category. So you did not have to twist my arm to be back. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful. So, um, Bruce, do you want to share anything before we get going? No, I just think one, one of the things I, I'm excited to uh, is to share something because I think we have kind of a similar philosophy, Rabbi. When I was a, a teacher, um, one of my goals, I was reading this in some of your, your information, one of my goals was to actually bring financial education to the child in the hopes that they would maybe teach their parents because I recognized that the financial stress was causing other problems in the family. And I thought if I could, if I could do a little bit there that they could understand and help their parents understand. And I know that was a big, you know, kind of goal, but uh, I think what I'm getting at is that this talk today, I, I hope everybody understands that it's not just about money. It's about intertwining everything there is in your life. And just so happens that money affects everything in your life. And that's why you have to have a good understanding of of not only money, but how it affects you and your relationships. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And as we'll discover as well, money affects everything and everything affects money, right? That's right. Yes. So Rabbi Lapin, can you share with our, with our listeners who maybe are not familiar with you, what it is that you do and how you came into this, this work that you currently do? Uh, well, I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> that's probably the <clears throat> most boring and uninteresting aspect of, <laughs> of the whole thing. Um, but um, I think mainly what happened was that uh, I found, because of some other circumstances, I found myself speaking for many very large Christian audiences. And uh, one of the questions that people asked me was um, after after assuring me that they don't have a microscopic morsel of uh, bigotry in their bodies, but you know why are Jews so disproportionately good with money? And uh, I realized this was a really important question and one worth going into, um, and I needed to answer it. And I mean, you know, maybe Jews are just good at ripping people off and. Uh, uh, and and that's the answer. Maybe you know, um, or maybe it's because you know the the old um, uh, sorry jokes about uh, you know how to how to get a Jew to jump off a train will drop a, a a dime out the window. You know that sort of stuff. Um, maybe those things are true. Anyway, needless to say, mm. after extensive research, I was able to answer the question, and and it wasn't based on that. It was based on some really valuable principles about how the world really works. And mm-hmm. um, 
and things that could be useful to absolutely everybody because uh, more money is much better than less money. Absolutely. Well, I think it's just so fascinating that I think we can have all these new strategies and new ways of trying to do things. And yet sometimes going back to the oldest wisdom can truly give us the power to move forward. And so we're going to be doing that today. We're going to be going back to very old, ancient Jewish wisdom. Yeah. And there's I mean, so much is, reality. You know, not, to say, not to say that there's no room for the other kind. There, there really are two kinds of, uh, of knowledge. Uh, knowledge that has to do with science, has to do with physics and chemistry and, uh, and, um, and, and all, all areas of the natural sciences. Um, it's an unarguable fact that I know more about those things than my grandfather did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, it's not that long ago that they thought radium was a really healthy thing. And they used to put people uh, to go through radium therapy in radium mines. And uh, these people died of radioactive poisoning. You know, mm -hmm. we now know more than we did then. And by the way, hard for many scientists to retain the modesty necessary to or the humility necessary to realize that in 10 or 20 years time they're going to know a whole lot more than we do now mm -hmm. uh, but then there's another category and that information does not increase year by year like scientific information these are things fundamental to the human condition so uh, uh, things having to do with male female relationships and sex there's nothing new to be discovered about that really your, your great grandmother knew just as much as, as, as you do. Um, and, and maybe more because she hasn't been misled by many uh, contemporary arguments and distortions of reality. Um, how to mm -hmm. relate to siblings, uh, relating to parents, raising children. There's no new information on raising children. Don't for a minute dream that the latest issue of psychology today is going to come through with a mind-numbing, shattering revelation that is going to make raising children easy because now we really know the secret. No, it's, <laughs> that's not how it works. And, um, oh, and I laugh money, because I'm, I'm right in there, uh, in yeah, the trenches with two I, young I, kids on I my own. I was thinking about that. That's right. So... Yes. Uh, and money is not in the first category. Money is not about things we're going to discover more and more and more about, things we've known and must <clears throat> forget. And so I did a podcast on Bitcoin a, a few months ago. And, um, and, and the point was that you don't need an advanced degree in mathematics to get the idea of what Bitcoin is and whether you should invest in it or not. Um, the idea of people agreeing on something having value is thousands of years old. So there are many things that it makes more sense to understand, not to look forwards, but to look backwards. And mm -hmm. that's really what ancient Jewish wisdom on money is all about. So we're going to talk about that because I do want to talk about that ancient Jewish wisdom, but in preparation and just being fascinated by everything you bring to the table, um, and, and being a trained biologist, you know, I, I, it really came out of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that you mentioned. And, you know, as an educator, I went to a very good uh, school to teach me how to be an educator. And it, but even back then, I thought, well, wait a minute, I'm doing all this practice teaching, but they're watching me do this teaching. So then I'm actually aware of that this happening. So you can't really get a true idea of what I am or are they, I can't get a true idea of what they want from me. And that's the observation you're, you were talking about in the Heisenberg uh, uncertainty principle. And it's, it happens in everything in life. So when you're really talking about money or sound principles, I always say it comes down, it comes down to modeling. You know, we can tell people all the yeah. time, about you know this this and this so if part of the uncertainty principle is about observation then really what you're trying to the best way to teach something is through modeling and i think that's the foundation of what some of the things you're talking about right and and what you were alluding to earlier on <clears throat> i i agree with entirely which is that um you know you could have a tennis player 
and we'll all, those of us who are tennis enthusiasts, will flock to Centre Court Wimbledon to see the guy play. And um, somebody will come up to you and say, look, I want you to know, you know, he's got a rotten reputation. He has a temper. He doesn't keep his word. And your answer is, who cares? Have you seen him play tennis? Right? Right. And the same is true. Um, you know, there are actors and actresses, mm -hmm. um, and you know, many of many of the greats um, who really can act. You know, were, were lovely people as well. But there are also very capable craftsmen of the stage and and the screen uh, who are horrible people. And somebody says, why are you going to that movie? Have you any idea what sort of, do you know how he treats people? And again, the answer is, it's irrelevant. Right. But there's one field where you'd never say that. And that is business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I'm going into business with somebody and a friend comes to me and says, are you crazy? Do you have any idea what a rotten human being is? He is. I don't say, so what? Have you seen him with numbers? I say, whoa, I put everything on hold. Wait a second. I need to, I can't go into business with somebody who's got a bad reputation. Mm -hmm. It's one of the only areas of activity where doing well is a function of being good. And this is a very hard thing for people to hear because they love the idea of Scrooge, the horrible, selfish, venal millionaire. And that's just not how it really is. By the way, uh, permit me to make a correction. I made a terrible mistake. Do you remember when we spoke? And um, I think it was, <coughs> I think it was late January, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yes. Um, and, um, when I reviewed it, which which I did, it's up on YouTube, and I, I, I just wanted to check. Um, I made a mistake. Hmm. Um, I spoke about Warren Buffett having become the CEO at a dollar a year of an investment banking company and saving it. And this was during the trading, the, the treasury bond trading scandal of the early 90s. And I said Lehman Brothers. I said it was Lehman Brothers. It isn't. That was a mistake. And so I corrected now. It was Salomon Brothers. Now, these are both Jewishly founded uh, early 20th century big banking houses. But um, the fact is that what happened is they had uh, misbehaved. They had submitted fake bids for Treasury um, at the treasury auction and they uh, they were fine well when it when a financial services company loses its reputation that's that's all there is mm -hmm. in fact to quote warren buffett one more time he said uh, when he was speaking to a new class of recruits people who just joined the company he said to them if you lose me money he said i'll be okay with that but if you cost me a shred of reputation you're through and so this is a very, a very interesting proof of, of this, this point you'd raised where we started, which is that um, Lehman Brothers, excuse me, again, I'm making that mistake, Salomon Brothers is virtually through. They're leaking, money is pouring out, everybody's pulling their money out of there. It's doomed, it's all over. And um, uh, it wasn't... Um, uh, I forget the uh, Paulson was the treasury secretary at the yeah. time. And he gets a call from Buffett in the middle of the night. And um, basically the end result of this is Buffett becomes CEO of Salomon brothers for a dollar a year, I think. And uh, as soon as that announcement is made, everything is fine. Stops leaking money, money comes back. They get limited permission to uh, to to rejoin the treasury auctions, and uh, and Salomon Brothers went on. I think they were bought by Travelers later on, but you know, basically everything everything continued. All that was because a guy called Warren Buffett said, "I'll move in to that office, that corner office on the top floor." 
and people because people he has a trust reputation he has a reputation for trust that's right mm -hmm. and so you can be a great tennis player and a great actor and a, a person with a rotten reputation that's not true for business and mm -hmm. that's what makes business such a valuable activity in the life of a country and of a society well i love that you're sharing that even at the beginning here so let's talk about what is business what is money how are relationships related to it? So let's start with that idea. What is business in the first place? Uh, business is, um, uh, is, is just a technical term for people being nice to each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that. It is. It That's is. all it is. You're and serving we, people. Whether you like it or not, we happen to live in a world where, and again, in, from my perspective, I'm going to say the good Lord designed it this way, but it makes no difference to me. You know, I, if, if, if you don't like that formulation, use whichever you like. But, but the bottom line is that we are incentivized to be nice to other people with, with, with an incredible blessing called financial abundance. <laughs> That's what it is. So uh, business is becoming as useful as you can to as many other people as possible. What yes. could be more beautiful? Now, again, from my perspective, I know that God smiles on us. It's beautiful. Yes. And why? Because our father in heaven is not that different from our fathers on earth. And I know that uh, one way uh, our children and our grandchildren can pain us and aggravate us and irritate us and annoy us it's enough words like that um is by fighting with each other and squabbling and arguing mm -hmm. and i i have a client who uh, who just on monday of this week uh, sat down with me and his he's he would seem to have everything in life everything God has blessed him and he's done well. And, and he's a lovely person with a great reputation. And he is in tears and he is beside himself. What is the problem? One of his children is estranged for the last two months. Won't talk to him or his wife. Won't talk to the siblings. This is very hurtful. Mm -hmm. And so similarly, when we take care of our siblings when we look after our fellow citizens for me it's not hard to see that this makes our father in heaven very happy indeed and and a lot of people make the mistake of assuming that because i'm making money doing so that that somehow morally discredits the entire process mm. it, I, I, I know somebody who um, she came to talk to me about this. This was a, a woman who, um, uh, who suffered from a cancer. Thank God she went into remission and is cured. Um, but she lost all her hair during the treatment. Very common, very normal, very natural. And she went searching for a wig that would look natural and, and make her feel comfortable. And she found one overseas. I don't remember where. And uh, she was so happy with it, she started importing them. And she went to um, Sloan Kettering in New York, the cancer treatment center. She said, hey, you guys, you know, if you like, I will set up in an office. I'll set up this so that your uh, lady patients can immediately step in. And if they want, they can just have this, this whole thing dealt with in a really nice way. And um, she did that with a few hospitals. And the result is that she, she, she provided this wonderful service for so many women. And uh, she became very, very wealthy and successful doing so. Mm -hmm. And she came to me to talk to me because her, <clears throat> her rabbi, she was Jewish, her rabbi told her, I feel embarrassed to even tell you this as a Jew, that there can be a rabbi quite as asinine and moronic as this. It's scary. But uh, he said to her, um, uh, you're profiting 
of the illness and suffering of other human beings. You're a terrible person. Mm -hmm. uh, if you really cared about other people, you would do it for free. You'd give them wigs for free. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, right, why this is very upsetting. Oh, yes. Because it takes a little bit of broader understanding to understand that she was very unlikely, as would anybody be, to suddenly, you know, dig into her reserves, particularly at a time when she herself was in, in pain, and suddenly start distributing wigs. Like, who, when is that going to happen? Well, and I told her, there needs I said, to be resources to do that. Yes. Yeah, right. I said, go back to the rabbi and tell him you want to start a chair. You're in the charity business. You're a rabbi. That's what pays you is basically charity. So why don't you start a charity to do this? Go ahead. I don't mind. And I bet you won't do it in the end. You, you know, it's all talk. And um, I don't know if she ever went back to the rabbi and challenged him on it, but, but I helped her understand that she's doing an incredible service. And the fact that she is being paid for a service doesn't make it in any way less it makes it better because there's no woman who buys a wig from her who felt coerced to do so mm -hmm. they people came to her because she paid the the rent to be on the site and nearby and she was compassionate and she was effective and she was competent that's why they did it and guess what most of those women, like most of us, would much rather pay for our services than receive them as a charity. Absolutely. And it's a huge benefit to them, and they're happier yes, after course. the result of the of transaction. Course. So, in, you know, that basically I think we have covered very satisfactorily the answer to the question of what is business. Yes. So there's so much that we need to cover in this show today. But tell us, what is a happy warrior and why do we need to think about life from an integrated perspective? Okay, so um, on my podcast, which flowed from my radio show that I used to have on KSFO out of San Francisco, although I never lived in San Francisco, but, um, but a, uh, a, a wonderful one of the great, great, great legends of radio was in charge of KSFO and we were friendly and he uh, had me do a show there. But... Um, Always, I've spoken of my listeners as happy warriors. And, and the reason, in a nutshell, is that, um, that first of all, um, being happy is a moral obligation. And that's a hard thing to catch on. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to say that um, among the, the, the terrible uh, parts of me as a child, I mean, I'm a little bit better, but not much. But um, uh, I, I remember, unfortunately, uh, a time when I was walking around. I was 11 years old. I'm walking around and whining and grumbling and, and being an absolute misery. And at one point, my mother said to me, um, stop this. We've had enough of this already. I want you to be happy. And I said, well, that's easy get me a motorcycle and I'll be happy. <laughs> and all of a sudden, like, wow, you know, my goodness. For the rest of the day, I walked around with four finger marks on my face. <laughs> my mom had, had a very uh, strong approach to education. Bruce, you're an educator. So, you know, you can, you can relate. She had a different style from what might go down well in an American public school. But, um, uh, but she was certainly a very effective child raiser with, with a monstrous um, urchin like me. So um, she said, don't ever forget, I'm not responsible to make you happy. Mm. You are. Anyway, I, mean, uh, I eventually matured a little bit and, and realized that um, nobody should ever get married until they've learned this lesson because otherwise they are going to poison the environment of their home and their spouse with this horrible, and it's, it's, it's an addictive disease to radiate your misery. Being happy is a moral obligation. Um, there was a, uh, a rabbi's wife, uh, who's, who's a, a dear friend of ours, no longer alive. Uh, she uh, was five years old when her family was taken to Auschwitz. She was in a concentration mm -hmm. camp. 
and um, family family killed, everyone killed. Mm. Uh, uh, Auschwitz was liberated before they got to her. But she talks about how her father said to her, you have a job. Your job is to walk around this camp singing with a smile on your face all the time. Mm. Because that is the last possible thing you can do for the tragic condemned souls mm. whose last days you may have the privilege of brightening. Oh, wow. Rabbi, it reminds me of... Uh, what was the name of the movie? A Beautiful Life, uh, and that was that was kind of the underlying theme of that. Yes, yes, we are going to make. He was going to make his son's life in the camp by just his mindset. That's right. Happy. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah, and he was going to make it a beautiful life no matter what because you control that right on your own. And Viktor Frankl wrote about the same thing, the idea that... Man's Search um, for Meaning, of course. Yes, I love that book. And it was this idea that the it's last all, it's thing... It's all the same, very much yes. the same thing. So <clears throat> you, you do an incredible value to the people you live with by being a happy person. And that's, and you, that's the moral obligation you're talking about. You literally enhance... That is the moral obligation. And for God's sake, don't get married if you don't know that yet. Because mm. this way, you're a miserable human being. You know, tough luck. But why would you want to make two miserable human beings? And that's what you'll do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at least two. At least two, <laughs> that's right. So, um, so that <clears throat> is the, the idea that um, you have the capacity, regardless of the environment, regardless of what's going on around you, uh, regardless of whatever stimulus is, is impacting your existence, you have the, the choice. It's a moral obligation, and there's nobody who can say, I'm incapable of doing that. There's nobody who can say that. Absolutely. It might be hard, but it becomes a lot easier with practice. So uh, when I speak of people being happy warriors, the first part of it is happy because not only are you going to do better in terms of social and family relationships, if you are a happy person, uh, you will you will you will um, you will initiate a happier and better marriage, and you will sustain a better marriage if you're happy. Uh, you'll raise children more effectively if, you, if you're a happy person. Everything is better. And on the business front, um, because business is serving other human beings and you're most effective at serving other human beings um, by having a lot of people know you, like you, and trust you. Mm -hmm. And if you're a happy person, that's part of the secret of being magnetic. I mean, there Absolutely. are certain people, uh, you know, I, I think of, of certain people as a, like a, a jar of Drano out of the hardware store. They, they literally, they just drain the life out of you. They suck everything out uh, because that's what being an unhappy person is like. If you have a business and you have key people in your business who are unhappy people and who don't know this rule, get rid of them. Because they create an environment of fear and trepidation. People are frightened to come up with new ideas. People are frightened to say what they think, lest the unhappy person will be set off. Mm -hmm. And everybody walks around, well, he wouldn't like it. Tough luck, get rid of him. So happy mm -hmm. is, is good for finance. It's good for family. It's good for friendships. And it's good for your physical health. Absolutely. And uh, that's the happy part of it. The warrior part of it is uh, also is just as important. And that is to recognize that we live in a world of entropy. You know, now, what does that mean? It means that everything moves towards a state of disorder. Mm -hmm. Now, the books behind me uh, appear, and that's, that's not a fake background. Those are real books. I, sometimes, <laughs> I have to sort of reach back and take one out so people... And no, no, it no, looks no, beautiful enough to not be. So thank you for pointing that out. So many well, no, not really. I mean, stuff isn't in the right place. There's a bit of disorganization there. And, and here's the crazy thing, you know, about once every year to 18 months, I try and, and get them all uh, where they should be. And 
a year goes by and everything is messed up. Not everything, but a lot of them. Usually I should be able to find a book in the dock. I should know exactly where a book is because these are my tools. This is my workshop. I'm using this all the time. And um, as long as I wait, my books will never organize themselves into the order they should be in. It only goes the other way. Mm -hmm. It's like a kid's bedroom. Yep. But you can tidy up a kid's bedroom and you walk in a week later, it's chaos. Yes. <laughs> Why don't you start off with chaos and see how long it takes for it to turn into <laughs> neat and tidy? Entropy doesn't work that way. Um, you know, you and we don't talk about it much. And so really it's an amazing thing when you think about it that God built a universe of entropy for for very good reasons. But it's weird when you think about it, because the reality is that if you took a Buick and uh, put it in a field and you set up some surveillance equipment and you watch it for 400 years at the end of 400 years actually less than 400 but wait for 400 years it's going to be a pile of rust um a few fragments of rubber some broken glass there's there's nothing there mm -hmm. how about we go the other way let's start off with a pile of rust and broken glass and rubber how long do you have to wait for it to turn into a car <laughs> Why should it only go one way, not the other? And it sounds like a stupid question, only because we're so used to it. It's like Einstein, uh, it's like um, uh, Isaac uh, uh, Isaac Newton asking why the apple falls down. And most people, especially kids in school, wrinkle their nose like, "What are you talking? Why? Where else would it fall?" And they don't realize how stupendous that is, because when you put an apple here, it really ought to stay right there as it does in space, by the way. So, um, uh, so we understand that we live in a world that tends towards chaos and disorder. So that means that um, if you want to have a house, then you must get used to the idea that you're going to have to paint it and that the roof is going to need repair. And you're going to have to get used to the fact that uh, the garden is going to grow into a jungle of weeds if you don't work on it. Everything moves in the direction of disorder. So you, you need to be a warrior. You've got to be willing to fight. Uh, your business, your business tends towards deterioration and uh, you've got to fight it all the time. And it's, it's, not, it's not natural. It's called work and work is a fight. Um, why is it that if I just relax about it, my body uh, will not go in a good direction? It's going to become larger than it needs to be and less healthy. Why have I got to work, you know, in a gym? Why have I got to regulate what I eat? Why, why is everything a big fight? Welcome to reality. It <laughs> is. Everything worthwhile is a big fight. And so we all need to be warriors and really happy about it. So you talked about in, in your book, and I just, I love the depth of everything that you're sharing and just the, the questions that we often maybe wouldn't pose to ourselves, but you're asking, why does it go in one direction instead of the other? So I think sometimes there can be this challenge in thinking about money, thinking about it holistically and thinking about how do the relationships in our life, specifically our family and our friendships, how do they relate to our money? And really why do we need to have this fully integrated life so that we can be peaceful and joyful and yes. whole beings that are happy, not, not this zero sum game. Like you talk about in your ebook, the holistic you, this, yes. this idea of it's not just, I have good relationships or I just have a good fitness, or I just am good in my finances, or I'm just good in business. Yeah. Really. It's this idea of not, not, uh, you know, hyperactively trying to do all the things and manage everything and feel like we're juggling because I think that's a scarcity mindset really to say, I'm just doing one thing after the next to try to maintain or just uh, put out fires in all these different areas of my life. But how do we think about our life as one integrated unit that we have all these different areas that we, we want to improve in? Um, it's, it's a great question, of course, and, uh, and I suspect that uh, with your own life experiences, you could probably answer it um, as well as I do, perhaps in a different way. So uh, my uh, approach to that is 
that, um, uh, you know, I, I like cars. So I talk about cars. Is that okay? Can I talk about cars, Rachel? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Bruce, I knew you'd be fine. I mean, you're going to be okay with me talking about cars. But, um, but um, you know, if, if, uh, if you ask my wife whether she likes her car, she'll say, yeah, I really, I'm enjoying it. And then you might say, well, what sort of car is it? She'll pause and look around and say, well, it's, it's a sort of gold colored one. Yep. So, um, and I don't, I'm not Danny. She's a great driver. I'm not Danny. It's just, she's not interested. You know, it, it mm -hmm. happens to be a Subaru. She, she just, you know, it's, it's not important, but uh -huh. uh, here's, here's the thing about cars. Let's say that I am so into cars that I decide I want to make by definition, the best car in the world. I mean, I'm willing to spend any money on it. I want to make the best car in the world. So um, um, I make some inquiries and I discover that the best engine is the W10 engine that they put in the Bentley and the top, uh, the top Audi. And uh, I order one of those. And then I, I buy, I say, what's the best transmission? Well, a Borg Warner eight speed um, uh, high, uh, fluid clutch. That's the one to go for. I order that. Brakes, um, uh, double caliper Brembo brakes from Germany. That's the way to go on brakes. And then I find out suspension. I get the best suspension. Now I've got a, a warehouse downtown with all these parts, right? Lying around. So I now call a, a good couple of mechanics i say guys would you just put this all together and when when it's done we're going to call in the reporters because we're going to have the best car in the world because you can see we got the best components of everything well it's not going to work because nobody told me that i have to match the transmission to the engine nobody told me that the brakes have to be matched to the suspension nobody told me that the whole system has to be tuned and it does, it's, a car isn't just a bunch of separate components. The genius is not just the components. The genius is how they all integrate. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's like a person saying, you know, I'm, I'm not interested in cardio. Uh, I'm really only interested in nutrition. I believe in the, the, a person being really healthy and being as healthy as a person can be so listen to my advice on nutrition. Here's what you should eat. Here's what you should stay away from. Watermelons are toxic. Just, I'll tell you what to eat. And I, okay, fine. But could you tell me about exercise? Don't worry about exercise. Okay. How about cardio? No, don't worry about that. Um, um, bone strength? No, don't worry about that. It doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. it, you can see that with our bodies, the genius is not only the heart and the lungs and the kidneys and the, that's not the, the only genius. The genius is how it all works together. Mm -hmm. And it, our lives are like that as well. And, you know, one of the, the simple and obvious explanations, I don't know if, if either of you've come across this, um, but there's something called a placebo in medicine. Mm -hmm. And most doctors don't like them because it sort of makes a mockery of 10 years in medical school, you know, but, um, but everybody knows that every single blind test shows the effectiveness of placebos, not a hundred percent, not on absolutely every single person, but on between 70 and 85% of people are impacted by placebo. Now a placebo means that if you have faith in the medication, it'll do better for you than if you don't, mm -hmm. if you have faith in your doctor, you'll, you'll do better than if you don't. And so right off the bat there, we can see the connection between faith and physical fitness. Well, those are two of my five F's. Oh, faith. I thought you meant religion and God. Well, that's part of it, but that's not all there is to it. And so to block out um, all of spirituality, when that is so much a part of who we are, the whole reason that economics is called the dismal science is because People do not make rational financial decisions all the time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we often spend money on emotional reasons. Now, emotional is just another way of saying a part of spiritual. 
Absolutely. Um, you know, there, there are people who can't avoid buying stuff that's on sale. They think it's irrational. Saving. You didn't need it. Yeah, but it's cheap. Yeah. <laughs> they think they're saving money. Yeah, I'm saving money. I get it. I do understand because I understand economics is not a science. As mm -hmm. a matter of fact, until um, the 18, early 1800s, economics used to be in the religion department of universities, not in the science departments. And then they introduced the word econometrics as if, oh, good, now we're going to really be able to measure. It's not true. The fact is we can find a thousand men in America of the same age and who've had the same earning history for the same period of time, right? It's 300 million people. It's not going to be hard to find a thousand guys who have earned the same amount of money for the same period of time. Are we going to find they all have the same net worth? No. Mm -mm. Of course not. Because spending is more <laughs> fun than saving. And Absolutely. some, sorry. I said, absolutely. I mean, I think that's the normal natural path of humanity. We just mentioned this on a podcast earlier this morning, but without that warrior side and being in control of your financial that, life, yes, exactly. that is what exactly. it tends to. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, um, so what distinguishes the millionaires from the paupers in our test group of a thousand men, spiritual factors, that's all. Do mm -hmm. you have the willpower and the strength? Yes. to do what you should do when you should do it or not. Mm -hmm. well, that, that, you all, to... that you all have earned the same amount of money we get. That's the measurable part of the economics. But what have you done with it meanwhile? And now that's spiritual. So, um, and so that's why it is that, first of all, uh, one thing that is, I think, beyond dispute, and that is that uh, if you have a great relationship family-wise, great relationships family wise and you have great relationships friendly wise you have lots of friends and the relationships are good and not only do you have family and friends but your finances are in great shape and not only that but you actually have a relationship with god as well so your faith is in shape and your physical health is in shape you don't actually have a lot to grumble about in life yeah that's true like, that's true you, what are you going to say? Well, I don't have fun. Of course you do. Everything you do is fun. Mm -hmm. And so um, these are the five interlinked areas that if we can get them all right, you have a great life. And getting them all right is vastly easier when you realize how interlinked they all are. I think the that other, is... The go ahead, Bruce. I've, the other thing I've noticed about that is if you surround people... Uh, that have a common mindset on all these faith, friendships, families, so on and so forth. If you start to stray, they will actually tell you you're straying and you got to uh, correct your mindset. Yeah, if that's right. That's part of, of that's part of choosing friends and, and having friends. Absolutely. So it's a, a, a rabbi mentioned, you mentioned about that demographic that is the, the poorest or least successful that you found being the, unmarried male yes that's right and yet and yet most people would think it had to do with race or social economic you know problems and and so on so no on on, on uh, average that? it's indisputable and this is statistics from the u.s department of labor um single white men have much less money than married black men that's so interesting yeah, the it's, um, it's so the reason that people are so uh, accustomed to speaking about black poverty is because the welfare system from the 60s on did so much to destroy marriage and family among blacks. But it's not just among blacks. And so this is not a <clears throat> this is not a skin color thing at all. Uh, you can look at, um, uh, unfortunately, vast swaths of the population in the United Kingdom. They're white, and yet they have all the pathologies of poverty because the, the marriage and family system has collapsed. Along with the friendship. 
a long awesome. friendship goes as well. Exactly right. And so the idea of, that you can retain financial integrity while foregoing uh, faith, family, friendships, it's laughable. And I guess you could ask, well, then why aren't, uh, why aren't females in that situation? And I, it probably because the maternal aspects of females tend to draw more towards fr family and friends where the male aspect is not as much so. That's what I take out of it. I don't know if you have an opinion on, on no, that. I mean, unmarried that's, woman. That's very much a part of it, but uh, it's exactly the same explanation for why the overwhelming majority of consumers of pornography are men. Um, it's also why the overwhelming majority of violence is inflicted by men. Uh, we are two different species. There's men and there's women. Now, I'm not allowed to say this, but it's true. And, um, you know, uh, genetically, I wouldn't be shocked if somebody told me that I have more in common with a tiger than with a woman. <laughs> so it. um, it's just two, it. di it's two different species. And um, men without women are incredibly, can be very self-destructive. Well, I think it's just so interesting and we'll have to wrap for today, but I think we need to have another show that we um, don't schedule a time to end the show. We'll just have an indefinite time frame. And Rabbi, I'm sure that that could probably last about seven hours. So I we'll think you're to, right. We'll have to make sure we eat well during the show. Um, we had a lot of live chats on today and we're, we're not going to get to some of those people, but uh, uh, people seem to be really relating to you, uh, Rabbi, and, and to the topic. And where I think where are you looking, Bruce? on youtube oh wow really oh great and i just Lovely. i just see a few but um some are recommending your books um biblical secrets of the bible is a great book changed my life thanks rabbi lapin um somebody else said thou shalt prosper is also a great read so um, i was getting back to a couple of the comments as we saw them coming in but i just wanted to thank you for joining us today i would really encourage someone to go get your book um the holistic you and that's an easy download, a quick, easy read, but I, I shouldn't say easy, a quick read, but very deep and very depthful in terms of this idea of integrating your full life and making sure that you're really working in all of these areas, not just in one, because as you improve your family, your other relationships will flourish. As you improve your other relationships, you have to be good for those relationships to thrive, which means you're going to be more productive in business. It's not a trade-off. And I think what's beautiful about living the good life is that as you build your business, you have more friends. You're able to show your kids and teach your children how to have good relationships with others. And it's all integrated. And the more you work out and have good health, the more energy you have to go into all of those things. And so I know from experience that everything that you shared in that is absolutely true. So can you share with our audience and our listeners? And I apologize that we had, I feel like this show was so short, even though it was almost an hour. See, it's can like what I told you. It, it is. Same as last time I spoke to you. I, when you said we're running out of time, I looked at the, I couldn't believe it already. It's been so fun talking with you, but, but shall you want me to tell people how to get that? Yeah. Yes, please tell our listeners how to find you and how to get that book, The Holistic You. Sure. Uh, my website is rabbidaniellappin.com. That's L-A-P-I-N. That's L-A-P-I-N, rabbidaniellappin.com. And, um, and you just look for uh, the free download. It actually is free. We've, we've mm -hmm. made it accessible to everybody. Um, it's, I mean, it's obviously the start. It's the it's the gateway to a totally new way of understanding the challenges you face in life. And, and, and so in a way, I've sort of just told a lie. I said it's an entirely new way, and it is because, you know, it's not out there. The truth is it's about 3,000 years old mm -hmm. because I think that my grandfather understood the interconnection of these various parts of life better than I did. And it's something I've worked on for a number of years now. But, uh, but unfortunately, because we live in an age of specialization, people think in terms of specialization with us as well. And so um, 
you know, there, there's something wrong with, uh, with my nostril. I'll go to a left nostril specialist <laughs> who works in an ear, nose and throat office, you know, who works in on a floor of a hospital. Everything is down to, well, there are certain things that work better when you don't specialize. Mm. And, you know, being a mom is one of them, isn't it? Right. You can't, oh, you yes. can't tell your kids, well, today's Tuesday. I don't do, you know, I don't do food on Tuesdays. <laughs> Uh, exactly. you, you you do a lot of things all the time and um and and in in the same way that economic success financial success does come from specializing and focusing on what is the one thing you will do best to help other human beings at the same in the same way when it comes to shaping and sculpting your own life the key is realizing that everything is holistic Mm -hmm. Your physical health is tied up to your mental health. It's tied up to your faith. It's tied up to your finances. Yes, that is true. Healthy people do better financially, but guess what? Financially effective people are in much better health. Mm -hmm. uh, this is very intri intriguing. Uh, I'm going to say three quick things in closing. One, absolutely go to we, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to direct them to, to the one you said, Rabbi. That's R-A-B-B-I, Daniel, D-A-N-I-E-L, Lappin, L-A-P-I-N dot com, Rabbi Daniel Lappin dot com. Go get his download, sign up for his newsletter, listen to the work that he shares. This is just fascinating and will absolutely revolutionize your life. And here's why. Having an abundance mindset is different than having a scarcity mindset. And there's nothing that you can do to fully understand an abundance mindset, unless you just start the pursuit of building that abundance muscle in your life and never stop. And you'll never get there. You'll never fully arrive and you'll never be completely abundant with no scarcity in your life, but you have to continually pursue that. And absolutely reading his books is one way to continue exercising that abundance thinking muscle and really just coming at life from a grateful, wonderful, um, just a whole and a very exciting way of doing life and business. So continue building abundance by getting the book and the download. And then I just really wanted to encourage you, if you're listening as well, to think about your financial life from this holistic big picture perspective and to have somebody that can help you with that. You can also book a call with our advisor team. That's over at themoneyadvantage.com. We'd be happy to help you look at your whole financial life and help you do the best that you can with that. So Rabbi, thank you so much for joining us on this show today. Uh, I'm not joking about having another show where we have an indefinite time, pre time period. So uh, I'll, I'll reach out to you <laughs> yeah, on that soon. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you uh, so no, much. Thank you for having me back again. And um, uh, it's just, uh, you guys have just got good chemistry and, and you know what, you really are interested in the topic. That's what makes you interesting. And you obviously care about money. You care about business and, and that makes a big difference for your clients and the people who come to you for counsel in moving along positively in their financial lives. So I'm just delighted to be partnering with you all on, on this, uh, on this program and um and and you have you have a great following you really do you have a lot of people who who watch you and listen to you so here we are and i've enjoyed it so thanks for having me guys wonderful thank bruce, you so thank much thank you rachel thank you thank you bruce and thank you rabbi we will be in touch soon Hello, in closing people. please remember success leaves clues so model the successful few not the crowd and build a life in business